In this episode, David meets up with his nieces, Kira and Quinn, to talk about their experience at the final day of the Midwest Gaming Classic 2019. Hello and welcome to another Zelda podcast. I'm David Geisler, your co-host for today's show, and today I am without my regular co-host, Kate May. This is actually part three of our Midwest Gaming Classic series of episodes. So today I am talking about uh, our experiences at the Midwest Gaming Classic and all of the things that happened on Sunday, the final day of the show. Now, most of you maybe have listened to our episode about Friday Uh, where we were designing the booth and setting up the booth, and that was all very exciting. Most recently, I had an episode with Alex Sheehan, uh, where we talked about our stuff on Saturday and all the people we interviewed. That was a huge one. But I'm really excited because today I have two very special co-hosts. So I think some of our listeners know that on Sunday, Alex and I had a little extra help at the Another Zelda podcast booth at the Midwest Gaming Classic. And today, in the studio, I am joined by my two nieces, Kira and Quinn. Kira, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kira, and I'm nine and a half years old. Sweet. And sitting right next to you is my other niece. Quinn, and I am seven years old. Fantastic. Now, girls, I was pretty excited to ask you to kind of join me on this episode. We had, you remember Cousin Alex? He was on our Saturday episode. Well, he was in the booth with us, wasn't he? Helping. Mm -hmm. And then before that, my friend John Klein helped me set up the booth and design the booth. And it was a really fun time. Now, a lot of times on this show, we talk about Kate, May, and I talk about like our favorite Zelda games and how to play the games and all the different things that we love about Zelda. But this, this has been a very special three episodes because we had this very special journey of having a booth at the Midwest Gaming Classic. So let's do this first. Quinn, would you like to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Um, I like doing art and I like playing music because um, art makes me happy because it I can just draw whatever I want. I don't even think. And then music, I just like playing um, a lot of different um, songs. Yeah, that's wonderful. I just make up songs. I don't know what songs, but I just make them up. I love that. That's great. And do you have a favorite Zelda game? I could guess which one it is. Mm. Based on your interview with Cousin Alex, it was probably Breath of the Wild. Yeah, it's Breath of the Wild. And um, I got a house with um, with a lot of stuff. But oh, I, yes. In Hatno Village, you bought a house recently. Yes, huh? and um, I don't really have a lot of stuff. There's just like... Stuff where I could hang um, some swords, some weapons. And also I have a bed and could sleep until morning, noon, or night. Mm-hmm. And um, that's all. Yeah, you're you're really on a nice journey with that house. You've just bought it, and I think you're slowly starting to upgrade it with mm-hmm. the builders, huh? Cool. And also then we have Kira. Kira, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I am a gymnast. I'm on a team right now. Mm-hmm. But it's... I do three events. I do, well, it's a different type of gymnastics. It's tumble and tramp. tramp. Okay. Well. Oh, tra- like trampoline? Yeah. It's like tumbling. Cool. I do like really hard stuff that most of uh, you guys that are listening mm-hmm. can't do. Like, oh, my. If you can't, like, I don't know how to say this. But, That's okay. Like. Like just really complicated stuff that yeah. you're working on and practicing. Yeah. That's well, cool. Is it a challenge for you? Yeah. And on trampoline, there's this thing called a double mini, where, like, one of those trampolines are, like, Oh, that's okay. Slanted. <laughs> I bump the mic all the time. It's all right. Like, I, like, slanted. And then, like, one is straight at the top. Yeah. And, like, there's this red strip in the middle mm-hmm. that, like, is harder than, like, the white part. So, like, you do a jump over the red from the slanted part where you hurdle onto. You do a straight jump over mm-hmm. the red part and then you do something like a flip off i see that sounds like a lot of fun yeah sometimes link does acrobatic things when he's (laughs) climbing around on breath of the wild you've played breath of the wild too a little bit yeah shakira you have a horse i believe and so does quinn Quinn, you have a horse what's the name of your horse quinn i have a lot of horses um i have bogum yuliano um those are the two ones oh yeah oreo too that's right oreo Um, was the horse that's kind of has the black patches and the white patches yeah made sense that's a good name 
Do you remember what your horse's name is, Kira? Gianna. Gianna, something like that? It was Gianna because I named it after one of my friends from my old school. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. Now, Quinn, you did actually play one other Zelda game for just a little bit. You've played a game called The Phantom Hourglass. And is it's this the one, one that you gave me? It is the one I gave you to play on your 2DS, and you yeah. play it with the pen. Do you remember that game a little? Uh-huh. And what's that? Can you describe that game just a little? How do you play that game? How is it different than playing Breath of the Wild? It's different because um, the normal character that's Link doesn't doesn't really look like the same. Oh yeah. So um, I just play it and then um. You use you don't really push buttons to play that game, right? No. Um, I play with the pen and then I tap on someone. Um, I remember this, but um. I was playing the game, um, and um, someone said that bad guys were coming to get me, and then that's all I heard. And then I was trying to go hide, and oh, didn't, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't really want to fight the bad guys, yeah. so I, I'm too scared that I would get like, I would die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure that as you play Zelda games, both of you, as you play more games, you'll get better and better at them, and then pretty soon, for example, like in Breath of the Wild, Quinn. When you get even stronger and your character gets, when Link gets even more and more mm-hmm. weapons and when you get more confident, you can go out into the wilderness. And if you do find a couple goblins or moblins or whatever, you'll be okay in a while. You've got plenty of years to play Breath of the I Wild. I know, but in Breath of the Wild, I see some um, bad guys. And yeah. one time, um, Uncle Dave was in the room with me when I was playing Breath of the Wild. And um, um, this girl was dressed up as a... She was actually a bad guy. Oh, yes. And um, she was pretending that she was really a, um, a person. Mm-hmm. But then I got so surprised I wanted Uncle Dave to do it. So, and then I didn't, I don't remember if he actually did it. Yeah, I do remember that. Now, that's a character that is part of the Yiga clan. And the Yiga clan are kind of the bad guys that work for Ganon. Mm hmm. It was, it was a little freaky, huh? I know. Every, um, once I was up in the tower, I had, um, um, one of those things where we shoot the arrows. Oh yeah. And um, I looked up closer and then I saw bad guys and then they started shooting, um, towards them and then yeah. I and then from far away I I actually got one. Um, they're on this little stone. Yeah, I remember this. And um, and I and I. So were you scared or did you have to be brave or how did that work? I was brave because I was up at the way top. Mm, right. And then, um, and then, um, I, then I went down there to see if there's any treasure. Right. And because, um, I need more things to buy more things for my house. That's so, true. Um, but I do have a door. You have too. the door on the house. Now, Kira, do you remember that time when you were riding a horse around Breath of the Wild? And you're just galloping along, you're having a really good time, and all of a sudden you turned the corner and there was a bunch of those lizards. And they're like, <laughs> coming at you. Oh, yeah. And then that's you, right. And then you had to, like, run fast. You had to press A, it's and like, then it has to go here. real fast. Oh, and, like, you rode I, like, so fast on that and horse. I, like, like, as soon as, like, I saw them, I was, like, I was kind of, like, panicking. Yeah. Even though it's, like, a game. Still, mm-hmm. you don't want to die because then you lose hearts, and then mm-hmm. you don't get that long of a life after you get half of a heart or a quarter of a heart. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, I tell you what, I'm so glad that the audience has kind of met Wait. you a little bit now. We ta- oh yeah, what you have another thing to say? Yes. What's up, Quinn? Um, mm-hmm. my uncle, yeah. he has um, a horse that goes really fast. Are you talking about me right now? You have a horse that's really fast. <laughs> I I do. I was I worked really hard at the game, and I found some special armor that helps the horse go uh, like two or three carats faster. And it's really fun. It's really fun because that horse just can just fly across Hyrule with that horse. It's really neat. So let's talk a little bit about the Midwest Gaming Classic. So um, on Sunday morning, I was already at. The, I was already in Milwaukee. Uh, cousin yeah. Alex and I, we rented a hotel, and then we yeah. were at the Midwest Gaming Classic right in the morning. Mm-hmm. But, Kira, I'll, how about you start with the story? How did um, you two get to Milwaukee? Because I talked to your mom a week before, and I said, could Kira and Quinn help at the booth? It might be a kind of a fun thing for them to do. So you're driving up with Papa. What were you expecting to see? I wasn't expecting to see two rooms of booths. Yeah. I was just expecting to see, like, 
a huge ballroom of them. Oh, right. Like so, a huge cement room that is huge. Yeah. Quinn, when you guys were parking the car, what kind of emotions were you feeling? I was feeling um, really happy. Um, and then once we got in and then saw Uncle Dave's booth, it was so cool. And then I started playing some little games on, on, the, t- on the little TV. Yeah, you did start playing some of the Zelda games up on the TVs, huh? That's neat. So we had you there to help us hold down the booth because it was it was very, very busy on Saturday. It was a little yes. less busy on Sunday, but I was really, really happy to have you there. And we were able to do some pretty interesting interviews. I tell you what, let's keep talking about working at the Midwest Gaming Classic, but I'd like to cut to one of those interviews right now, okay? Now, this was, uh, this was a gentleman that I spoke to, and he was playing The Legend of Zelda on the Super Nintendo that we had set up. And he was doing a really good job. So I sat down with him for just a little bit, and he told me about how he used to play it. Um, as a kid, and how when he went to yeah. Afghanistan in the military, he actually brought just that one Zelda game with him and played it and played it played it. Now, both yeah. of you actually have played that game, too, just a little mm. bit. Do you remember the one where you have to sneak into the castle? It's on Super Nintendo. We played it oh, a few yeah, months I ago, kind of so. together. Oh, yeah. That one? Mm-hmm. And it's raining, and, and Link and is... Yeah. Then we have to try to get... Then we, gotta, yeah. then we got to try to get the princess out. Yeah, we had to yeah. save the princess yeah. out of the uh, the cell down in the mm-hmm. bottom. That was a fun game. So a lot of people really liked that game. And so did this gentleman. Let's cut to him right now, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, I am here with our next guest at the Another Zelda Podcast booth. And you know what? I actually don't even know your name yet. My name is Kyle. Kyle? Yes, sir. Nice to meet you, Kyle. Nice to meet you. So you're hanging out over here playing A Link to the Past on and on our station. I mean, this is the only game I really came here for. To like, This is the one game I was actually looking for. Really? So I'm actually pretty... I was pretty pumped that you had it up oh. on the, uh, the big screen. Then you kicked me over to the... Uh, to the display up here so everybody can see my magic. That was fun. Well, I saw you <laughs> playing and I was like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. Time yeah. to put it on the big screen. Like a bicycle. So I'm going to assume that A Link to the Past is your favorite Zelda game as well. Yeah. That, no, that was my favorite game of all time. Of all time? Yeah. That's cool. Talk to me about that a little bit. What, what, what appeals to you about it? I don't know. Like uh, when we were when we were kids, it was I had, I had two brothers at the time. I got you know, four now. Yeah. But uh, we grew up on this game. You know, we bled it. Every day we'd wake up, even if we'd beat it. You know, we'd come. We'd still go back and and do it, do it over. Like I, like I, I don't know if you. Heard, I told you earlier. Yeah. I um, went to Afghanistan, and this is the only game I downloaded on my little computer. Oh, just so I can play it. Yeah. So I jam out on this all the time. So I love it. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. That's cool. It's weird because I like like you know how you dig up the flute at the one section. Yes. Okay. I know the exact location. <laughs> I love it. I can get it within two within two uh, swipes of the shovel there. <laughs> I love it. That's great. That's cool. Do you have any second Zelda games that you've ever been drawn to? Like, how do you feel about no, Breath of the Wild I, and stuff these days? I don't. Uh, Not so much. No, I mean you know, that's cool. That was. I mean. We, I, we didn't play. We didn't play the first one at all. So I mean, my fiance, she's a huge Zelda fan, but her favorite, like, she likes the Zeldas after that, where you're riding right. around the little horse and and doing all that stuff. See, I, all that. I was never a fan of that. Like, this was my. That's cool. That's, my, well, that's what's deal. so great about Zelda games is there's. I mean, there's 20 of them now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's uh, my co-host that I do this show with. She's not here this weekend, but. Um, we will even find that. Oh, I really like this part about that game. Yeah. Oh, I don't like that about that game, but I like this about this game. And it's, <laughs> yeah. but it still it satisfies everybody. Every yeah. there's a there's a game for everybody in the Zelda franchise, in my opinion. Oh, heck yeah! Now I, I want to ask you a little bit more about A Link to the Past because I have a confession. It's kind of my game of shame. It's it's like the really? one Zelda game I can't beat. Oh man, I'm so bad at it. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's just like the frame rate or the play mechanics because I enjoy the Legend of Zelda on Nintendo very much. Yeah. But um, I don't know. You got any tips for me? (laughs) I I would just keep grinding on it because, like I said, I mean, nowadays with the games, you know, like right now I'm hooked on State of Decay. Okay. Yep. So, I mean, you look at the graphics from that to that, you know. Right. It's easier to give up on a game that's this old and say, well, I'd rather play something like Gears of War, you know, something along those lines. I hear you. You know? I hear you. I do uh, think A Link to the Past is one of the... It's on the it's on the more challenging side yeah. when it comes to the Zelda games. Yeah, that are I out mean there. a lot of things like finding everything. Like I said, my brothers and I when we were little, yeah, you know they'd sit and watch me play, and I was mostly the the game player. They just watch. You know, yep, they're the backseat gamers of the family. But uh, well, no. if I may, I had sisters that used to watch me play Zelda, yeah. and it's it's one of those games where even if it's a one player game, people don't mind. Yeah, watching you, you can watch because you're pretty you're progressing with it, and you're like, oh man, I hope he finds that next. Absolutely. You know, so absolutely. So they'd root root you on. 
just so they could get past and see the next what whatever is going to happen next. But yeah, most of it was just finding everything. I also think that like um, the way the puzzles work in the in the dungeons in Zelda games, it's totally fine to have an audience kind of like also kind of figuring out the puzzles, even if they yep. don't have their hands exactly. on the controller, they're still in the experience. Yes, you know? exactly. Yeah, that's I mean, cool. I remember my sisters saying to me like, I'd come home from school and they would say, "Are, are you going to play Zelda tonight?" <laughs> they just wanted to watch Zelda yeah, happen. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> say, when are you going to play Zelda tonight? <laughs> yeah, that is a nice thing. I'd be like, well, I don't know. You got any pizza rolls? <laughs> <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have hey, you play and, you, just, and chatting a little bit. That's really great. Heck yeah. Uh, have well, a good day. Yeah, you too, man. All right, cool. So I really enjoyed talking to him. I thought that was really pretty nice. When we were sitting in the booth, um, let me ask you this, girls, whoever wants to talk about this. There was a task. We had some cards. We had cards just like this one here that I'm holding in the studio here. Yeah. And, uh, and you were uh, tasked with passing them out to people, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. How did that go? Was it a fun time? It, it was really fun because we got to wear these lanyards that Alex and you yeah we're wearing mm-hmm. it felt like we were actually working well there. you were part of the staff you were part of our staff you were part of our our booth crew and so you definitely wore the lanyard so that people knew you were working quinn did you did you get a chance to hand out any postcards yes i did and i was kind of nervous because um i didn't know what to say to the same. people yeah same yeah i guess once you get out there in the aisle it can be a little intimidating it could be even intimidating yeah. for me and i'm grown up my heart was racing really hard yeah but like I had like butterflies in my stomach because still I didn't seem I didn't know what to say to the people. Yeah. So that's why I was a little nervous. Now, another thing that was kind of fun that we did out on the floor. I know that you went around with uh, with cousin Alex a little bit and a little bit with me and a little bit with Papa. But um, Quinn, you were kind of going around through the booths, kind of looking for a, 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 a stuffy or something, weren't you? A stuffy. I was trying to look for Princess P. Baby Princess Peach. Oh yes, yes, yes. And um, but I didn't find her there. But I fo- I found a big Pikachu. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, and it was for ten dollars too. Um, that was a great deal. That was our and price then, range. And then I was, and then I looked at it. and I'm like, oh god, I really want it. So and then I went back with you. Yeah. And then Papa took me, and then I, we kind of got lost because I forgot where it was. Oh, it was a big space, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. It was. But then um, but then um. Alex didn't know how big it was, mm-hmm. and then um, we bought it, and then I start holding on to it, and it's like real big. Yeah, it was super <laughs> yeah. cool. Do you, you still have it in your in your bedroom, maybe, or do you have it in your playroom? Yeah, I have it in my bedroom. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So, um, let's see. Did you girls get over to the pinball games at all? Actually, yes, I did. I oh, yeah? went with you. So those... oh, I'm so sorry that I forgot. I know you also went over there with Alex. I think that's when you actually got yeah, to play a little I d- more. I don't. Yeah, I went over there with Alex. Because he and took then some you. pictures of you playing that I saw that I didn't remember. I didn't. I think I, I went over there with you. I oh, didn't. I remember what it was. Right in the beginning, all three of us. I just to show you around. I walked you through where the pinball machines were. I didn't. Were. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. That's what I, it was. I didn't like it because it was so loud in there. It was very noisy. Yeah, it was kind of exciting, but it was very noisy. So then, as the day continued on, uh, I think you all got a couple snacks. Kira, I think mm-hmm. you found a place that sold egg rolls, and we were. It was on. really good, actually. <laughs> yeah. I what egg Quinn, rolls are one of my favorite foods. Ever. Yeah, they, they are very tasty, and they're often found at harbor markets and mm-hmm. conventions and all the yeah. rest. Yeah, I went to the harbor bu- harbor market yesterday. In Kenosha? Yeah, down by the lake. Mm-hmm. And I got two egg rolls. Nice. They were so good. They're like the chicken ones with uh, sweet and sour sauce. Quinn, do you remember what you got for lunch? I don't recall. Did you get a lunch? You Because we were eating yeah. snacks a lot in yeah, the booth. Yeah, in the booth, yeah. I remember I had we had stuff some. To eat. We had a lot of like the little like nuts and seeds to and eat. And we also we also had you also had some chips. I probably ate those. <gasps> That's right. I think when I got a sub sandwich, there were some Doritos that I didn't care for, and I think then you had though you snacked on those, which was nice. And, and anyway, yeah, she did. After lunch, what I'm getting to is after lunch, we had a little bit of downtime, and Alex sat down with the two of you and had you be honorary hosts and interview him. Do you remember this? Yeah. Yes. It was so fun and weird at the same time. <laughs> because, like, I was a kid interviewing an adult. <laughs> I love it. Well, I was pleased. I was so excited to have you be a part of this show. And even being here in the studio today is really exciting. But um, can we play that? that the, so Quinn interviewed Alex first and then Kira did. I want to play both right now. We can listen uh, to I, 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 I would. I would not... 
Well, I, I, I will be okay with doing it right now with me. Just doing it, like doing the interview with me interviewing Alex. Mm -hmm. We'll do it right now with me. First. Yep. Okay. yep. We'll, we'll hear Quinn interviewing first, and then Kira. Yep. We'll just listen to both right back right. to back and come and back in. Gonna... We'll be back. Whoa, we're you two are back. becoming hosts. That's amazing. Hello. Hi, Quinn. How are you? Good. Do you like Zelda? Yeah, I've play been playing Zelda for a long time. How long? Ooh, I, uh, I'm 32, and I guess I started maybe when I was three years old. So let's say, I don't know, 29 years. Uh, I played since I was six. Since you were six? Yes. And I'm how old seven. are you now? 20? Seven. You're 20? 27? 27? Seven. seven. Oh, seven. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. 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 Which game do you like? Zelda. 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 Okay, cool. Is it Breath of the Wild? Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> do you like playing Breath of the Wild? I do. My favorite part of Breath of the Wild, when you have to go on the water on the back of the Zora, and get into the divine beast. That's my favorite part. Um, my favorite part is where we can build ice cubes and then we can dive into the water. Yeah, that is really cool. Have you ever uh, built ice cubes on the walls? On um, like, there's yeah. a shrine where you can do that. Yeah, that's a fun one. I have my um, I have a own DS and I do not have any Zelda games, but I do have a few. Which ones? Um. Lego Star Wars and Lego Star, Star Wars. Wars, we have to play with the pen, and then I have Mario Kart 7 That's that a good I one. like to play. Who is your favorite character to race with? Princess Peach. Yeah, she's my favorite too. I like about Princess Peach is when we race um, with the motorcycle, she puts on an outfit that I like. Oh, right. Sure. So she can be more aerodynamic? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. So she doesn't get her dress stuck. In exactly. the motorcycle. In the wheel, yeah. Yeah. Kira, did you have Kira any questions? Kira wants to interview. Okay, Kira. Oh. <laughs> okay, Kira can talk. Kira said to talk Kira louder. Kira can interview, then I can pass out the cards. There you go. All right, well, well, thank you for having me on the show. You're welcome. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so do you, how long have you been playing for Zelda? Well, I'm 32, and I started playing when I was three years old, so 29 years of Zelda. That's a long time. I don't think I played when I was three. I think I might have been a little older. Three is a little <laughs> young to play video games. I might have yeah. watched Zelda being played. Uh, my first... My first big experience with Zelda was with your Uncle Dave playing Ocarina of Time on the Nintendo 64. Did you ever play that game? No. No? How many video games have you played? Like How many video games have I played in total or Zelda? Or of Zelda. Well, I think I've played all 20 of them at one point or another. I haven't beaten them all. How many have you beat? Ooh, that's a good question. Let's say maybe 14 or 15 of them. All of the main ones for sure. Most of the Game Boy ones. What's your favorite video game? My favorite video game of all time? Not just Zelda? No. Oh, that's that's a tough question. Well, I really like the Metroid series. Super Metroid is a really good one for the Super Nintendo. I really liked Chippendale Rescue Rangers for the Nintendo. Do you know about that one? No, I've never heard of it. Okay, you're two chipmunks, and you run around in a city, and you like grab apples and throw them at cats and things, and the main enemy's name is Fat Cat, and he's a big old cat that smokes a cigar, uh, and you gotta beat him. Okay. That was my favorite game. <laughs> my favorite game is on the Wii U, Mario Kart 8. That's a good one. That's a fun one. I love playing that one. And Quinn has a 3DS, so we play Mario Kart 7. That's cool. Who's your favorite character to play Mario Kart as? I think Go... Oh, uh, Gold Pink Peach. Gold Pink Peach. That's the one I, I use that one too, with a motorcycle. I like the... Um, it has like the speaker in the back. It's like... And of it's the pink cart? Of the car. Yeah. And, it ha and it's pink with... I don't know if I've ever played with that one. It's a good but one. But I've played with it before. Oh. So. Anyway, well, thank you for having me on the mm -hmm. podcast. It was nice talking You're to welcome. you. You're welcome. We'll talk to you later. Bye. So that was so nice. How did you feel about your first time ever being a host on a podcast? Weird.
Um, a kid interviewing an adult yeah. is weird. So, yeah, you yes, did a wonderful weird. job. I feel like you both did a fantastic job. It was so weird. Like, yeah. What if people could hear us? Well, they they just they yeah. just heard they all walk, that. They walk by. They're hearing this right now. Oh, you mean while you're in the booth, yes. you could tell that there were other people walking around. Yes. Well, that is a little bit more stressful recording in a public space like that. Like today, it's just the three of us and Schrodinger over there. Um, we don't have people walking by. So this is a little different, huh? Weird. <laughs> so let's see. I want to ask you a little bit more about the Midwest Gaming Classic. Okay. Was there anything that stuck out that wasn't video game related? I know, Kira, I think you went and saw the Jurassic Park cars for a little while. That was cool. Yeah. I took a picture with them. It was so cool. And the Ghostbuster car. Yeah. Quinn, have you, you have not seen Jurassic Park yet, I believe, right? No, because I have to watch it when I'm 13. Yep. That Cute. is very appropriate. It is very I appropriate that you have Yep, we'll wait a couple of years and we'll all watch it together. That'll be a fun one. Yes, because Uncle Dad told me. What are some of your favorite movies right now, Quinn? Star Wars. Nice, very nice. <laughs> uh, do you have, do you, Quinn, Kira, do you have any favorite books or anything? Um, like series? Yeah, sure. Well, we're just starting to watch Harry Potter together. That's yeah. kind of fun. So fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was all the Star Wars movies, and now we're going through Harry Potter. But anyway, if we go back to Zelda, or let's go back to the Midwest Gaming Classic. Towards the end of the day, um, it was starting to... It was it was a long day, right? Did you, yeah. <laughs> it was so long. long. I almost fell asleep in the car. Going home? <laughs> no. Do you remember how it started to snow? Yes. Out of nowhere? Out of nowhere. It was like a normal spring day, and then a snowstorm snow. happened. Snow. Did you have to walk through the snow to get to the car and all that? Yes. Yes, it was so cold. I see, I see. So let's see. Uh, that was a great experience. Oh, I know. M halfway through the day, I actually re-met with an old friend. He walked past the booth, and I chatted with him. Um, could I play that interview right now? Sure, yeah, sure. I don't mind. I... That's great. Let's do it. Mine. I would. I don't mind. Don't mind at all. Here we go. All right, I am here in the Another Zelda podcast booth with um, our next guest, I guess you could say. And Matt, I'm so excited to bump into you. Um, it was a really weird thing. We had our booth set up here. Now, I, we've known each other for oh, years. Uh, seven, eight years? Yeah. I first or, met no, you like when I was bartending at 42 Lounge. Yep. And uh, you'd come on in as a customer. And I got along with you and your now wife. Uh, fiance still. We're going to be. Yeah, it's uh, November 1st and 2nd. We're going to be getting married to this year. Oh, that's year. wonderful to hear. That's mm -hmm. great. I was sitting in the booth minding my own business, and um, Alex, who's helping me run the booth, just saw mm -hmm. a person walk by and handed him a postcard. I looked over, and it was you. Yep. <laughs> we made eye contact. I got to say, how have you been? I've been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, a lot of great things have happened. You know, graduated uh, from MSOE mm -hmm. with a software engineering degree. I now work as a software engineering consultant. So doing a lot of really cool things, working with a lot of clients, helping them modernize their technology and their tech stack. So. I love it. I'm so happy to hear it. It's it's. It's a treat. It's a treat to see you. Um, so this is a Zelda podcast, but let's talk about Midwest Gaming Classic a little bit. Mm -hmm. is, are you a regular? This is our first time here. This is actually my second time here. Okay. Um, yeah, I came last year for the first time ever. I didn't know that it was something that was happening in southeastern Wisconsin because I guess it was over in Brookfield, but they came here because they needed more space. Yes. And uh, I was like, all right, you know, I got to go check this out. You know, um, I'm 32 years old now. And I'm starting to sort of see where the whole like nostalgia thing is really kicking in. Indeed. And it, that made me be like, all right, I, I got to go see if they at least have some of my old favorite games. Right. And I was just blown away. Have you, so, are you, are you looking for any good pickups as they say? Or is there anything you're keeping an eye out for? Or are you just kind of hanging out, seeing what you find? Well, I, I uh, picked up uh, today, I picked up a copy of Xenogears. Very nice. Which like I haven't seen uh, that game in a long time. I had a copy, but you know, as things happen when you're a kid, one of the discs broke in half, and that was the end of that. <laughs> yep, yep. I'm currently looking for the GameCube version of Four Swords, for oh. the Zelda Four Swords GameCube version that came mm -hmm. out where you'd have to plug it into the Game Boy Advances and all that. Mm -hmm. I had one when I was younger, lent it to a friend, never saw it again, and so now it's, even though it's not like a tremendously amazing game, it just, it hurts me that, it, that, it's, that I've lost it, so I'm always keeping an eye out for that one, personally. Yep. Well, I mean... I, Everyone says that like Final Fantasy VIII is one of the like lesser Final Fantasy VIIs, but I actually picked up a mint copy of that today too because I'm nice. like, I, I need that. That was my first Final Fantasy game. Oh, very good. Yeah, I didn't. I I had a friend that lent me their PlayStation to play the first half of Final Fantasy VII, and mm -hmm. that's all the deeper I got into it. After that, it was all Nintendo consoles for me, and I feel like I missed out a little bit. So. Nah, yep. Yeah. I gotta go back through somehow. Well, I mean, you gotta play some of the games for you know 
Nintendo's arch nemesis that they made, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, right. Yeah, the, yeah, how Sony was originally making the disc system for the Super Nintendo and all that stuff. Yep. Man, imagine that. I mean, I'm actually kind of grateful that it didn't work out because we wouldn't have had this whole run of Sony products that I think have been done some really amazing things. We wouldn't have like the trilogy of consoles that we have right now. We wouldn't have like the Xbox, you know, Sony with the PlayStation and then yep. Nintendo all at the same time. We wouldn't have that if that didn't happen. Now, since this is a Zelda podcast that I'm mm-hmm. running, let's talk a little bit about Zelda. Let me just start with a simple question. Do you have a favorite Zelda game or anything like that? It's going to be the first one that I ever played, Ocarina of Time yeah, on the N64, like original OG. Yep. N64 title. Totally. It's, I ask this to hundreds of people. I ask this question and it's almost always the first game they play. It's almost... Yep. I think it just makes any game in the series, it makes such an impression on whoever plays it. For for me, oddly, it was Link's Awakening was actually my first Zelda Which that is I another really good one. I love it. So for you with Ocarina, obvious nostalgia points there, but what else about the game sticks out for you? Uh, I mean, it almost kind of has like an open world concept before the whole like let's make open world a thing yeah i agree and being able to just kind of explore and do what you want whatever it is that you want to do when you sat down was huge because most of the games before that were pretty linear i mean super metroid had a little bit of like the adventure you know yeah yeah definitely uh, well put and, and and exploring but it not not to that extent not where you you know once you got out of kokoro village or kokori village uh you're just like wow there's there's so much space in front of me like what where do i go what there's do that, i do you're absolutely there's that first time you come out of uh the forest yeah the kikiri forest and the owl talks to you fine but then the music just goes and you're like i can go anywhere like <laughs> where should i go and and now we, we're so familiar with hyrule field it feels a little smaller you know like yep. we get it but at the time it felt it felt uh, uh, immense if i may mm-hmm so let's see. Well, actually, so if you enjoy Ocarina, may I ask how you feel about Majora's Mask, which obviously runs the same engine? Yeah, I really enjoy it as well. Oh, I'm happy I, to hear that. A lot of times people don't care for it. I also enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, the whole, like, um, what, the 48 hours, you know, like that time concept that they wrapped into the yeah, game. Because yeah. uh, I actually, I haven't played Majora's Mask since I beat it, which was now, what, like 15 years ago. Yeah, I know. Um, like, a lot of people get really upset with it feeling like the pressure of time but that's really part of the game and that makes you make a lot of decisions that makes you think about what you're doing you're like oh okay now i need to do this and this in order just to kind of like manipulate how things are going and that that there was a lot of fun for me actually i like it's almost kind of opposite too of ocarina of time and that's probably why people don't like it is because ocarina is like i do what i want Majora's Mask is like, no, you you get you kind of got to do some things. Yeah, Majora's <laughs> Mask is about figuring out the puzzle of that timeline. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I guess it is a less open worldy in that sense, but it's, you know, it's world exists in the narratives of all the NPCs. That's really what you're navigating yep. in Majora's Mask, where Ocarina, you're literally <laughs> navigating the world or whatever. Yep. I do enjoy Majora's Mask a lot. And maybe you'll agree, after the first hour or two of Majora's Mask, you start getting the, the checkpoint mechanic and that three day cycle doesn't burn so hard. It, it's yeah. a l- much more manageable once you get yes. in there. Yeah. And also another thing I liked about Majora's Mask was every NPC for the most part matters. Like they kind of have a little bit of a life and a little bit of a storyline. And, yep. and, and that was really groundbreaking at the time, I think. Well, and like I'm thinking about people like freaking out about like Skyrim, right? When Skyrim first came out and yeah. the NPCs had like their own you know, daily rituals that they would do and going around. And I think Fable did that a little bit too. Yes. And everyone, every time that happens, they're like, oh my God, this is like the first time ever. It's like, no, that was done all the way back. Yeah. Well, you know, Majora's Mask did it. I'm pretty sure that there's a game or two that did it before that. If giving like a full, like everything matters. What they do matters. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the super early Metal Gears for like a Japanese computer actually had one of those where every NPC had a track and a line and not just like a walking path, but had mm-hmm. a narrative. If you killed or defeated one character, it would affect other characters, I think. But I'm just, I'm not totally sure. But yeah, it might even go all the way back into the late seventies. You know what I mean? Yep. Can, can we talk about this amazing video thing that you did for your, uh, your proposal with oh, your fiance? So, um, yeah, I put my, uh, my now fiance, uh, on a four day quest that started in Milwaukee um and ended at walt disney world uh down in florida and i think uh all in all we had about 60 or 70 people that acted throughout the entire thing if i may yeah it was delivered through a series of videos Mm -hmm. and even like real world notes and symbols and things isn't that right yep yep 
because uh, you were a Time Lord. You asked me to play a Time Lord, and I was so excited. I was like, yes and yes, let's do it. Yeah, you were the uh, uh, the architect, I think. Yeah, I was just a yep. Time Lord. I wasn't yep. a doctor per se, but yeah, like a Time yeah. Lord, which was I was still tons of fun. Yeah, and so like you were sending these messages to Nina that she then had to watch. We put them up on YouTube because yep. that was the only way you could transmit them, <laughs> and that it would always give us the next clue of where to go. So like we started out at our place, um, ended up going to the Schlitz, uh, uh, no, the Schlitz Park. Uh, for some stuff yep. um, and then we also went to like 42 lounge uh, the safe house um, there was a, a sushi place that used to exist uh, that was right around the corner from 42 lounge that isn't there anymore I'm now realizing at some point you had to get on a plane or something I'm nope. sure no nope. we actually we road trip the whole way oh that's amazing that's even better yeah so we uh, we left Milwaukee to then go down to the bong recreation area yep um, which is uh, just a, a campgrounds right outside of the Bristol Renaissance Fair because yes, uh, right. the second day was all at Bristol um, and at the very beginning of the entire quest, my fiance had, had gotten a big giant chest with three locks on it. Oh my gosh. And uh, the first key we ended up getting at 42 Lounge, the second key we got at the Bristol Renaissance Fair. And then uh, we had we had to go to uh, Mammoth Caves uh, down in Kentucky, I think it is, to go uh, pick up a rock from the area to get to her mom. Which is conveniently about halfway to Florida. Yep. And then uh, when we got to Walt Disney World, her mom was the one that had the final key to the chest. I love it. And uh, yeah, I ended up proposing right in front of the castle. Oh, Because, I mean, she, she grew up as a Disney kid and her mom retired from Disney. So I love it. I remember you you were tell, you contacted me and you were telling me about this epic plan that you had. And I was like, I actually think Matt can pull this off. Like, if this is anybody else, I'm not sure. But like, I think he's got this <laughs> under control. This is going to be really cool. And so obviously, obviously, it was an exciting experience, I'm sure, for her and you alike. Yeah, it, it took a year of planning. Oh, my gosh. Um, and it was, yeah, like I was saying, it was like 60, 70 actors. There were like 20 businesses involved. We had, uh, at any given time, almost around 10 staff people that were helping out either, <laughs> you know, just being online or, you know, calling places up before we got there, stuff like that. Amazing. Well, that's cool. Matt, it was so great to see you today. Tell Nina I say hi. Oh, and uh, this was just a special random treat to have you walking by and be able to chat with you again. Thank you. <laughs> well, Thank you, David. All right, I'll see you around. Oh, it was really nice meeting up with him. He, I, I hadn't seen him for years. Did you know that? No, I didn't even know who you're talking about. Yeah, it's okay. It's all right. I don't know if you <laughs> I ever don't know really either. Met him, but it's I've all right. Really it's all right. He was a friend back when I lived a, in Milwaukee. She back was in the with days. a group of people. No, he was there all by himself. That this, oh, he this was? particular gentleman. Yeah, but um, let's see. Uh, was there anything else that stuck out for you? I know you went around and shopped for some video games a little bit. Did you find anything interesting? No. Not so much. Not so much. Kira, you like playing video games, but you like to do a lot of other stuff too, huh? Yeah. Okay, I there like it is. <laughs> playing, I like playing board games. Yeah, me too. Because like, like they use you could use your mind more. Sometimes. Like sometimes. Yeah. And plus, like you can you have like you have to think which way you can go if it's like a maze or something like that. Sure, sure, yeah, that's cool. Um, let's see, Quinn, you. Do enjoy playing video games. Do you have favorite video games? Oh yeah, it's, it's Mario Kart. You said with the interview with Alex, and then it, it's cool that you like Zelda it too. It is, um, but it's all. I also really want this real fun game. Oh, which one? Pokemon. I want it. Yeah. I know, but we couldn't find one. We found a couple Pokemon games at the at the expo, but they were still kind of pricey, weren't they? Yes. They were a little expensive at the expo, and someday we'll find. And like, $15, yeah. $20. Yeah, for used games, they were a little high. Someday we'll find them at the right price, and it'll be very exciting for you to start playing Pokemon. I played it a little bit. I wasn't very good at it, but I have a feeling that you would be very good at it, Quinn. Mm-hmm. So, K Quinn, you have um, a couple Pokemon cards, three or four, I think. You've been kind of collecting them, and I honestly, I don't know how to play the Pokemon card game either. We'll have to learn together, I think. I the know, video game's a little I different. Want, I want more Pokemon cards. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I think you can get a collection mm -hmm. someday. Uh, let's see. Oh, hey, we all just now, before the recording, we took a look at the Breath of the Wild sequel trailer. Yes. The next Zelda game coming out. It was out. actually pretty kind of, it was actually pretty scary a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it, it does look scary. It was, it was kind of like, um, a scary movie. Kind of, kind of, kind of sounds red. like, yeah. kind of sounds like, um, freaky movie. A freaky movie? Kind of feels like I 
kind of every time I see something um freaky, I almost feel like I will f- throw up or something. Oh, really? A little nervous frog in your yeah. throat? I get like, it. I I like, yeah, My because I I, I always feel like it's me. a nightmare. Yeah, I, it always feels like it's a nightmare. Coming. Well, I've seen you be very very brave in Breath of the Wild, and you're getting braver every time you play. And pretty soon you'll be going out into the wild and you'll be able to battle bad guys and stuff like that. And I'm sure by the time you get good at that and the Breath of the Wild sequel comes out, you'll be brave enough to play it. What's up? I'm getting hand signals from Quinn. What's going on, Quinn? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, remember that time when we were playing Breath of the Wild um, yeah. um, and I was playing Zelda and you were playing? Okay. Um, I was playing? All right. You had a controller and then it started spinning randomly. We... No one did it. We didn't know what was going on. But oh, yes. Nash, was, my little brother Nash, was actually spinning the the um link around. So we were thinking if it was still going since he did it so um long. Yeah, this is a bit technical. But what happened was was when we started the game up yeah. or when we turned the system on, the little analog joystick on the controller was pushed to the side. Oh, it was. And so, it, so the system thinks that that's the middle of the controller it's a little complicated but mm-hmm. so when the controller goes to the, s- the center then it, the system thinks it's pushing to the side so we just had to reset the controller that time yeah that's right that's right um i know a lot of times you have fun riding around w- uh with your horse and having uh wolf link join you wolf link is really cool because um we don't even have to battle the bad guys because he just he protects you huh so then you might remember um, we had a gentleman come over who had a piece of artwork that was kind of 3D. It was Majora's Mask. Do you remember this? Yes. Yeah. I, I remember it. It was kind of like a dragon. Maybe it did kind of look like a dragon face. That's an actual mask from a, one of the Zelda games called mm-hmm. Majora's Mask. Yep. Maybe you've seen me run around with Majora's Mask on my face in Breath of the Wild. A little I- bit. A little, but I don't remember. Well, this was Stuart, and he and his son ran a company called Artivision. So we had him come over, and we talked about Majora's Mask a little bit and what their process was for making that artwork. Shall we listen? Yeah. Sure. Okay, I am here with, uh, I suppose, our next guest at the Another Zelda podcast booth at the Midwest Gaming Classic, and I have Stuart here from Artivision. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, thank you for coming over here and meeting up with us. Yeah, we're excited. We got so all... is this your first time being at the Midwest Gaming Classic? This if is I our first repeat show that we've done, uh, so this is our second year here. Wonderful. Yeah. This is our first year. We were, okay. frankly, a little intimidated because Midwest Gaming Classic is such a big thing. Yep. Um, I was I was actually quite nervous, but we have just loved the experience. It's really been yeah, wonderful. Great people here. Were you in the, Were you in the similar location last year? Uh, they had the rooms flip flopped. Oh, interesting. So we were in a different aisle, and it was much larger space. So mm. uh, people were kind of pouring out into the rooms. But I see, I see. So you have a booth running over there with your son. I'm yes, thinking that's correct. Excellent. And uh, what what you guys do is well, actually, I'll let you explain it. All I, right, sure. I, I passed by. I saw it. I thought I really want to talk to them, and I'll let you explain. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my son Jackson and I co-founded the business. Um, we started uh, our, our personal journey with this particular thing started about five years ago. Um, we've only been vending these for about a year and a quarter at this point. And they're framed artwork, you could say, but there's a special quality yeah, to them. Absolutely. So uh, we make framed shadow box artwork, 3D shadow box artwork, and there's four panels of acrylic. Uh, the back panel is actually EPVC, and we digitally print on each layer. Oh! Uh, and then we have custom frames made in cherry or black, and then uh, so we can do as little as one, or we can do a hundred. So because we do them all on demand. Fascinating, um, fascinating. Yep. So is it? How, how do you do? You have to then glue the layers together or do they mount separately? How does that work exactly? So uh, you may have seen similar uh, shadow boxes on Etsy or something like that where people make uh, foam core shadow boxes with right. dimensionality. Um, not, we don't do any cut paper exact or anything like that. We actually have uh, a, a printer that we work with yeah. um, that prints directly digitally right on the acrylic. Uh, and then when the acrylic panels are mounted in the frame, um, we've got, so it's basically four layers of dimension that are suspended uh, that creates this really awesome 3D look. And uh, for us, it's almost like performance art, watching people come up to the booth and just uh, seeing their reactions, their favorite games in this uh, new format. That is very cool. Yeah. If I, I actually kind of saw the booth from afar and just poked my head around the side to talk to your son real quick. Uh-huh. Are you printing over there live? Oh, no, we're not. Oh, okay, <laughs> <No>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have that done in uh, nearby a printer that we work with. Yes, I see. Yep. Very cool. Well, that's fascinating. And actually, the thing that really caught my eye was mm-hmm. this, and you brought it with you. Yes. This beautiful, beautiful, I guess, rendering 
of Maj- Ma- the Majora's Mask. Majora's yes. Mask. Possessive. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, someone request a Majora's Mask, and we wanted to do our version of it. Um, so uh, we kind of came up with this this beautiful kind of uh, gold leaf filigree design yes. that I think really complements it. I think part of uh, my inspiration for it was that I wanted it to feel like uh, like a like a collector uh, piece of an artifact that you found and mounted, and it was sitting in your personal like uh, trophy case, so to speak. The effect is wonderful. I think it absolutely <laughs> comes across that way, and it's interesting too as I look at it mm-hmm. because some of the work that you're showing is. 3D representations of what was a, a version of a screen yes. cap almost or a screen grab. Correct. I mean, they're not screen grabs. I'm sure you're, you know, creating all the assets and yep. everything. Yep. But sometimes it's like, oh, here's a Mario level in right. 3D. Exactly. This is something. It's it's mystical with this frame in front of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. We we have, uh, you know, we work with like. Uh, the sprites to kind of recreate the scenes and I'm, I'm all about keeping it pixel perfect and, and color it. accurate um, with something like Majora's Mask it's sort of it's so important for us to make sure that it's thematically feels right so we've got the 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 the, the wispy kind of dr- drama of the, the the magic of the smoke around it um, we want the the eyes are you know, bolting off the mask are, are kind of a signature Indeed. of the piece. Yeah, it, it helps them look like they're just glowing. Those They're just staring right at you. <laughs> and as I look at it a little bit more as we sit here in the booth, mm-hmm. it's almost feeling like it's out of the cutscene where it's floating there yeah. in the middle of the screen. It's Absolutely. a very artistic representation of that experience, and it's very cool. <laughs> Thank you. It's really great. So am I to understand that there's different pieces of acrylic that I'm just looking through here as I yes, look at it? that's correct. So the back layer is fully opaque, black. Yes. And then there's three... Uh, fully clear acrylic layers. I see, yeah, right. Um, so there are four layers in total of dimensional artwork that kind of creates the the uh, visual effect. It's absolutely beautiful. It's really cool. Have you done any Thank other you. Zelda pieces? Yes, we have done uh, Legend of Zelda, where you get your first Triforce piece. We've done um, uh, the Master Sword, where you, where you first get the Master Sword. Love it. Uh, and we were working on one where we talking to the Deku Tree. Oh, I'm sure that's wonderful. Yeah. What, what software do you use? Do you break um, it up in Illustrator and Photoshop? Or yeah, is it primarily other Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, man, that is very exciting. Yep. Well, that's wonderful. So if people uh, want to find more out, uh, find out more about you, where, yes. where can they do that? Uh, they can go to www.artovision3d.com uh, or they can follow us on all the social media. Um, it's hashtag Artovision3D, number three, letter D. I love it. I love it. Well, it was... It was uh, a treat to have you over here. Thank you so much for yeah. taking time out of your booth and, and popping over. Sure. We are just excited to celebrate the Midwest Gaming Classic and being here and meeting all, uh, up with the other booths. And thank you. Yes, thank you so much. We all appreciate right, cool. it. Well, I tell you what, I have one more interview to do here. But first of all, let's talk about uh, your, your going home. You you've went, the, the day was done. Remember, Papa was actually kind of ready to go home before the two of you. He was like, you guys want to go? And you were both like, no, let's stay a little longer. I remember that. And then we got to the end of the day. And I think we said goodbye to you guys. You helped very much in the booth. I did not want to leave. Didn't want to leave? <laughs> Me neither. I wanted to stay until 6.30. Yeah, well, the whole thing ended at 6, yeah. and it would have been fun. Maybe next year you can help us break the booth down, too. But then my friend John showed up, and he, Alex, and I took the booth, and we started taking it apart, and I have some pictures of that. And then we also left the whole space, too. Um, and you drove home. And so I have, right as we were, so there was a gentleman um, that was, his booth was right behind our booth. And yeah. he was a person that I've heard in other podcasts many times in my life. And I, he's even a person that I look up to a little bit. And so right at the end of the day, while we were breaking our booth down, we were able to, I was able to sit down with him and I had to use a different recorder and everything, a handheld recorder. And I was able to ask him just a couple questions about how he feels about Zelda and like being a game journalist and stuff like that. His name was Chris Kohler. And I, it's okay if you don't know who that is, but I'm going to play my interview with him right now. And then we'll say goodbye to All everybody. Right. Okay. Sound good? Yep. All right. Okay, so I am here with Chris Kohler, and Chris, we were, I was quite smitten, to be honest. We were booth neighbors, you <laughs> we could were say. We were booth neighbors, yeah. At <laughs> the back of our booths. It was, it, was, it was back of the booth neighbors, yes, exactly. So we couldn't really see each other during the show, but we always knew each other was there. There was one time where I kind of creepily came through the curtain to, to offer gifts of, of food. And I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> I kinda, then I went back the other way, and I was like, I thought to myself, was, I, was that a little weird to just pop up through the back? But anyway. A, a, a little. It was a little, a little weird. weird. Yeah. yeah, that's totally yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I was so excited because I was I saw on the list that you were going to be at the show anyway, and I've personally I am I am not a journalist I'm a media creator, but I've looked up to you and your peers for 
years. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. Back from the, the um, I had a little art gallery podcast when like the One Up show and even when Retronauts first started and oh, okay. the birth of many of things that came to be. Yeah. I remember when Good Job Brain was, you know, began. I remember thinking, oh, Chris is on Good Job Brain. I remember both. <laughs> it was all very exciting. So as a fan, I've been I've been tracking you and I'm, I'm so pleased that um, we're taking a little bit of time. People, we're at the end of the show here at the Midwest Gaming Classic. Everything, everybody's breaking down. The show floor is closed. There's everybody's clinks and clanks. Up. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, there's a lot of noise going on, but thank you so much for, for giving us a little bit of time. So you were here today at the show. This Was this your first Midwest Gaming Classic? This is my first Midwest Gaming Classic, yes. So um, I do Portland Retro Gaming Expo a lot, uh, and I do California Extreme a lot, and other various other shows that I've done. But I've never done this, and I've just, you know, it's, of course, it's been running for so long, right? Like, this has been running since 2001, I think. Yes. When it was, like, Jagfest, Atari Jaguar stuff. Indeed. So, I mean, it's, when you're running for that long, if you're continuously doing it and you know what you're doing the show gets bigger and bigger and bigger and this is a big big show There's tons of people tons of things to do and i had a great time and i just met a lot of people that i'd never met before because they live in the midwest and i live in california we don't really get to meet that often so yeah indeed yes i was lucky enough by chance to interview dan Lucen about a half a year ago and he's okay. one of the guys who really heads this up yeah and he was commenting on, on it basically grows almost 25 percent a year right now it's, it's, it's insane extraordinary this midwest great. gaming classic is exploding it's yep. very exciting yep. so you were here partly for um a retronauts panel i understand yep. Yep. and also you were here kind of promoting your book just selling yeah. some wares right yeah so show brought me out to you know to be on the retronauts panel um i offered to put together a panel of my own but they were like we're full <laughs> we're, you know we have tons of <laughs> panels yep. uh so maybe next year you know i'll get in a little bit earlier and do a panel myself uh but yeah so uh, you know since i was coming out here i've got a couple of books so figured might as well take the opportunity to sell some i mean typically i don't really do that um like the, the publisher sells them you get them on amazon right but, you know if i can bring a few down you know i don't really make that much money off selling one book here but you get to meet somebody you get to sign it get the personal experience so it's a lot of fun for me and and other people yeah and it even kind of gives the booth a focus you know yep. which is nice for sure which yep. is nice yeah um so i you know obviously we do a zelda podcast a zelda show and i wanted to ask you a few things about zelda but i wanted to ask you something about just video game journalism in general first okay. because you're one of the few people that i can actually ask this kind of question yeah. too i have been as a consumer consuming video game journalism for 15 years 20 years all of that I've watched the industry change and evolve and grow and go into video content and then the, the podcast exploding. And and now, I, I remember in a Retronauts episode way back in the day when they were talking about the thing called Twitter. You know, oh, this yeah. is like 12 yeah, yeah, years yeah. ago, 15 years ago. Yep, yep, yep. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on... I, I, I can't ask anyone else that I've ever met in my life this question. How has the the evolution of video games journalism? What is, what is your take on that? I mean, it feels like there's more sharing. It's better, but also many there's many more voices out there. How yeah. do you feel about it all? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you you've hit on it. Is the explosion of diverse voices, um, which is something that you know we're we're very proud of at Kotaku, especially, and I mean, you know, of course, many other websites that you know can can boast of the same thing. That honestly, I mean, you know, if you looked at video game journalism as early as 10 years ago it was a bunch of white dudes in their in their 20s 30s and 40s and um there's you know I, there's there's nothing i don't want to eradicate white dudes off the face of the planet because you know then i'd be gone too um but it's like it is it's it, it tends to be one sort of generalized life experience, one sort of uh, set of perspectives that we are bringing to bear um, on the, the the game criticism itself, um, and that's not that's not enough. That's not enough. Uh, and so it's it's wonderful now. It's obviously it can always get better. Um, you know, we we can do more um, to encourage you know more diverse voices to get in, and quite frankly, stay in and make it a more hospitable environment for people when they do start writing and things like that. So, as features editor at Kotaku, I'm in a, I'm in a position where I'm getting a lot of pitches from people. I'm seeing people you know write stuff to me, and I get to enhance. Um, the diversity of opinions that are on Kotaku by bringing in cool stuff from freelancers. Please pitch me if you're a freelance writer and you want to write for Kotaku. You know, it could really it could happen. Pitches at Kotaku.com. So, so yeah. And I think that's I think that's really kind of the key of like how things have gotten better over the past say decade or so. I agree, and this is happening a little bit with film as well in the industry where sometimes you might 
the, uh, the community might experience these odd bubbles of exclusion or a single opinion. And, and sometimes that's just maybe the human condition that comes with it all. But I think for the most part, it's a celebratory experience. More people get to have more voices. And I think that that's a good thing. Yeah. And it's like, if you want, I, you know, I dreamed of a world where everybody played video games. You know what I mean? And so it's, you, you've got to make sure that everybody is included. You've got to make sure that it's a big tent and you've got to make sure that you're, you're letting everybody, I mean, not, not that, not that, you know, it's not that, not, it's not about letting people in. Uh, so that was an inelegant word. It's, it's about making sure that like that, that door is open for everybody to pass. Yeah. Well said. I like that. Yeah. I like that quite a bit. Um, we've, we've even noticed threads of that. My co-host Kate May and I do uh, the show, another Zelda podcast. She couldn't be here today. She's in New York. Um, and we've even noticed as we, because m- many of our episodes, we don't just talk about one game. We'll do, usually do vertical slices, if I may. We'll, all, all the fire temples, all the whatever temples, all the whatever. Yeah. But, um, you know, the lore through the whatever. What that does for us is that allows us to observe kind of gaming history through the last 30 years. When you look at certain things that happened in the very first The Legend of Zelda, some of the stuff that happens in Ocarina, it's like you can feel a single perspective. And when you yeah. compare that to even Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword and certainly Breath of the Wild, mm-hmm. Link has gotten a bit more androgynous, the cultures are blurring more, you know, um, there's kind of, Zelda Hyrule, in a way, is almost kind of getting its own <laughs> morphic uh, culture, right. and I think that's great. It, yeah. it, it doesn't exclude, it includes, and it keeps it a little bit more abstract, yep. and we've noticed that even through that, through that series. Um, but I, what I do think I would like to ask you, and this is something that is hot on my mind and something I talk with about Kate a lot, and perhaps you have a little bit more expertise on the matter, is, you know, we know now in the news, it's been known for a while, that the, the sequel essentially to Breath of the Wild is in the works. Yeah. They're ta- you know, IG Numa said that it's with, the same with, engine. Uh, with, with, with like Monolith Soft doing some heavy lifting apparently, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 because yeah. they just had all those hirings that yeah, just happened. Yeah. Everybody got and excited about that. they're not saying that. like, yeah, we're hiring, they're, they're not saying like, Oh, we're hiring so you can assist on, you know, a Nintendo game. They they did like come work on Zelda with yeah. Zelda stuff all over the hiring ads. So yeah. Well, apparently it's true that they did a quite a bit of work on the terrain stuff in Breath of the Wild. Okay. Some of the streaming I have yep. heard. I don't yep. have a source yep. for that or anything, but that's what I think is where that's coming from okay. a little bit. Anyway, um, their largest observation about Breath of the Wild is that Ganondorf or even Ganon is is almost a force of nature and almost an afterthought in that game. Oh, okay. Do you think that there could be an interpretation of Ganondorf, a, 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 a humanoid type of character, mm. in the Breath of the Wild engine? We're just going into Fantasy Town here sure. in the sequel. Do, do you think that's even possible, or how they could do it? I don't think it's advisable. I, oh. think it's, I think it's possible, but it's like Breath of the Wild did, I think, this, this wonderful job of, of breaking free of the Zelda series conventions. And I think to then say, okay, well, we're putting Ganondorf in this time around. It's like... I don't know. Haven't we done that? Haven't we been there? Haven't we seen that dynamic between these three people? But then again, I mean, Ganon is that third part of the of the triumvirate of the people who own bit, bits of the Triforce, right? The wisdom, power, courage. So I wonder if a, a good way of doing it might not be to... Um, you know, like Zelda and Sheik uh, almost have a character in the game that that turns out to become Ganondorf towards sure. the end of the game, yeah. but is in fact, it, but you, but the player believes it to be a different character, you know, maybe even a, a, a character that is a, a, a good character, or at least a sort of a neutral character, and then sort of show the progression of that person to the point where they get to being Ganondorf. I mean, that might be a way maybe to do it in that open world, you know, situation where it doesn't it, they don't just sort of like plop Ganondorf down in the open world like here you go because that because as soon as you have that um, it, because right because in Breath of the Wild it's like there's no big bad that you're chasing there really in the isn't game. there's you do defeat a boss at the end of the game or at the beginning of the game if you want to right. um, and then of course the end and there's the boss you know characters inside of the um, the, the divine beast but um, to do that to do a linear sort of big bad villain story like in the in the content in, in that open world Zelda, which again I hope they just do another one of those. You know what yeah, I mean? Right. Um, yeah. Just more be, Breath of the Wild would be, would be fine would be with me. Tougher, so they'd have to do it in a way that is different. Yeah, I agree. I was thinking maybe there's a version where there's a little bit of a okay. They have their weather system. They have their day system. Could they have like a little? 
not NPC, but an AI system that also travels through the land and infects people's perspectives or something, and that becomes a counterpoint. But I don't know. That's the best yeah. I can come up with. Yeah. Um, because, you know, also with Ganon, the calamity Ganon in Breath of the Wild, the Ganon identity is so abstract that it's almost more demise from Skyward Sword than it is even, you know, this kind of sure. larger entity. Yep. Anyway, yep. I don't know. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that, and thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know we're pretty much at the end of the uh, yeah. entire, entire well, we event are done, here. So, you know. We are done. I'm not catching a plane or anything, so don't, you know, don't feel bad. <laughs> I see. Very good. Yeah. Well, um, uh, let's see. Unless there's anything uh, that you'd like to have people find of the projects that you're working on right now, um, if you'd like to share that, I'd be happy to share that with our listeners. Um, no major projects that... Well, I mean, so what I would like to talk about is uh, maybe of interest to your listeners. It's a video series I'm doing at Kotaku, and it's called uh, Complete in Box. And the idea was I wanted to do like a retro collecting type-ish series, but I, I was thinking like, well, what can we do um, that is you know, kind of beyond um, what you see a lot on YouTube. And what you see a lot on YouTube is somebody playing the ROM and talking about it, which, you know, that's great. I mean, you know, I love playing ROMs. Um, but on Complete in Box, I was like, okay, to understand the history of a game, I think you've got to have the game, and I think you've got to have the box and the manual, and I think you have to know about what does the manual teach you about playing this game? What does the box um, tell you about the marketing of this game? How are they trying to sell this game to people? What was the manual telling you about how to interface with that game? You know, it's the thing you don't get when you just download the ROM and start playing it. A lot of people played ET on the Atari 2600, thought it was terrible, um, because they didn't read the manual. And if you read the manual, the game is just bad. You know, it's not it's not terrible, but it's actually you can figure out what to do. And so we kind of talk about that. We talk about really rare games. We talk about, you know, we had stadium events, you know, on the show, and it wasn't mine. Um, and uh, and just we, we so we're going to be doing um, a bunch more episodes of that in the coming in the coming months. Uh, we traveled to Seattle to Pink Gorilla, uh, the, the store out there, to do some to do some stuff. We went to uh, Rochester, New York, the Strong Museum of Play, to shoot some videos. So it was like a coast to coast uh, season of, of complete and box looking at like rare stuff in a museum rare stuff in a store it's, yeah it's good it's gonna be fun that sounds wonderful. That's absolutely right up my alley. And our our, our podcast does kind of trend retro because it, we are talking about the past Remember 30 Zelda, years. Yeah. yeah, right? You, you know only what I mean? have one new Zelda game every couple of years to talk about. you got to go retro it's it's true. at some point. Yeah. It's true. Well, thank you so much for your time. And, and I wish you a, a safe trip home and all the rest. And I just really Thanks. appreciate thank it. Thank you. Those are for real... those of you listening to this via audio, we just shook hands. That's yeah, true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Thanks a lot. And that for me, that was really exciting because when I was just starting to make podcasts when I was a kid, Chris he was already making podcasts and stuff and so it was really neat to meet him in person it was I almost, have yeah. one question for oh, you Queenie, don't clap on anything okay. yeah what's up what how old were you when you started podcasts when I started making podcasts well I guess if I'm 38 right now it was uh, it was about 12 years ago so if my math lines up it was around 20 oh no I was younger I was like 24 or 5 when they first were kind of invented and pretty quickly, I started making podcasts way back in the day, way before the two of you were born. I had a little art gallery, and we made an art podcast. And then I did a technology one. And you guys kind of know that one a little bit, the Technophiles one. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, and now we do the Zelda one, which is a lot of fun. The Zelda one is so cool because like, you get to talk about like how you can survive and stuff. Yeah, it's, it, I, I've actually found I'm really having a really, really good time doing this show. And it's really fun doing it with Kate, too. You both saw Kate and I in a play together. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. She she played, she played We played husband and wife by the end of that play, didn't we? Really? Yeah. I remember, and then someone was the little cat. Yeah, there was an actress that played a cat. Yep, yeah, it's absolutely true. All righty. Well, I think we should get going here. Thank you so much for joining me in the studio today. I you really... are so welcome. <laughs> oh, I love it. I yeah, love it. You're welcome. You're little podcasters yourselves. I'm so proud. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Kira, why don't you say goodbye to everybody listening? Bye. And Quinny. Bye. Love it. Oh, wow. That's a little bit like Kate. She always goes, okay, bye. Oh, I have to do the outro real quick, if you don't mind, okay? Okay. So, everybody, if you've enjoyed this episode, and you, if this is the first episode you listen to, go back two episodes, because this is kind of part three of a three-part episode. But uh, if you have any comments about the Midwest Gaming Classic, you can tweet the show at Another Zelda Pod, or find us on Instagram at Another Zelda Podcast, or go to our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com, where you can find links to all of our shows, and we have blog posts there now, and also links to our Patreon page, and our Discord channel, where we have... We 
just got our hundredth member on Discord the other day, girls. Really? I was very excited That's about so that. That's so cool. It is cool. It's like a whole extra community of people that also love Zelda that get to talk about Zelda. And if people want to find me personally on the internet, uh, I am Rapture Paint on Twitter and Instagram, and also over there on Discord. So next week, I will be back with Kate May, my regular guest, or my regular co-host. <laughs> That's because you guys are guests. I've had so many guests lately that I'm starting to lose track. But I love recording this show with Kate. It's a lot of fun. We both co-host it. And we're going to be back with an episode about non-dungeon dungeons. So things that are in, in Zelda games that feel like they're dungeons, but they're not officially temples or dungeons or anything like that. So until then, girls, I'll see you later. Bye. Goodbye! Bye!